Dag on ticking me off. We ain't even started this thing. <laughs> Go ahead. Do something. Everybody, welcome back to the 307 podcast. Chili is wound up, tighter than Dick's hat band. And uh, his mind's just turning. We're trying to keep him under control. He needs an assistant. Now, look here. If any of y'all would like to apply for being Chili's assistant, send it to 3 of 7 merch at gmail.com. Yep. <laughs> and uh, Chili is looking to hire an assistant. That's right. Um, he's got many things. In the, in his mind that he's looking to bring to life, wonderful things. So, so he's looking to bring someone under his tutelage now. He's about ready for it. No, no, no. I'm not ready to take up that mantle. I just need help managing my my daily tasks. Have yeah. you added that to your Instagram bio yet? Top tutler. No, I you need, need to add that level twelve tutler. Yeah. <laughs> Toodle the world champ. Um, welcome back. This episode's brought to you by our Patreon members. Thank you guys that support the show on Patreon. Means a lot to us. Could have never imagined the generosity that you guys show toward the three of seven podcast. And um, it's also bought, brought to you by Nuff Said Running. Tell people about Nuff Said Running, Chili. Chili's the mastermind behind Nuff Said Running. No, no, no. It was a group effort. We we worked for thousands of hours with Fonzie, David Vahey, shout out, fi- filming, professionally filming a video course, 10 videos. It's over three hours when you put them all together, all for less than the cost of a pair of running shoes. We go through things like, like how to run on the road versus the track and the trail. We go through... Race day execution. We go through all the stuff that you might want to know if you're going to get into running. Or even if you've been running for a while, if you want to take it to the next level, uh, as I like to say. So, yeah, enough said running. It's a video course, and it's also a running camp that we're going to put on hopefully several times a year. Um, We've got dates out now. Um, and all the all you guys that have bought the course, thank you, and stand by. You're going to get a special email coming up here soon. As soon as I sit down on my daggone butt and type it out. Yep, look out for that. Um, if you've already bought the course, uh, we would love to have you at the running camp. Now, it's not required to uh, buy the course to come out to the running camp. If you just want to want to sign up and and come have a weekend running with us, I think it'll be really fun. I think I think you'll get a lot out of it if you want to uh, put some of these things that you learn from the course into action. Uh, if you want to hang out and get better at running, have a hard training weekend. I think it's good for that too. Um, I think you'll learn a lot, and I think I think it'll be a good a good for us, good for you, and I think it's worth it. So, well, you know what was interesting to me that I didn't expect is there are some people who are buying. Enough said running, the training series, that aren't necessarily runners, but they are doing endurance events. Like 29029 is a big one. I know we got a lot of people that have 29029 on their calendar for this coming up year. And yes, 100% this course will help you be successful at 29029. Or any endurance event for that matter. Yeah, for Um, sure. The 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 Maybe not endurance swimming. But well, even that there's, I mean, if you're just trying to get better at swimming, I wouldn't buy this course, but there'll definitely be carryover yeah. what about mountain biking there. I mean, Hey, I would just plain and simple, never mountain bike, but there is, <laughs> it, there is things that apply to all yeah. endurance events in this, you yeah. know? Yeah. I'm really passionate about the course, man. I'm really passionate about it because I know that it's going to help a lot of people achieve whatever goal they've set for themselves. And I'm passionate about people getting out and exploring their ability to run and to race and to show up to events. I'm passionate about it because there are so many people that need those types of things in their lives. Running has been one of my number one tools to maintain my sanity 
over the last two years. And the event space, as far as racing goes, the community at a race is just second to none, in my opinion. Well, and that's why the camp is cool to me, because it takes that a step further. You spend, you know, a whole day and a half or, you know, uh, really building that community, running a lot and and training a lot and learning a lot, but also just uh, doing kind of what races lack is, it's, you know, pretty much everyone running their own race on their own time and then hanging out a little bit at the end and then going home. This will take, it'll be way more than just that. Yeah. This isn't a race, you know, it's more about the community than than the, even the running itself. We're going to do a lot of running, but it's not even about that. So that's enough said running. This podcast is also brought to you by the basic course. How are you feeling about the basic course this weekend, Krista? I'm looking forward to it. I am too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> We got little Becca B on this class, man. Yep. We got uh, uh, Danny. Danny, yeah. The halfway decent runner. Yeah, Novo Dog. Yep. Um, Dustin Gendra. Y'all know what it is and y'all know what it ain't. We got a stacked team. We're going to have to, we're going to have to really, we're going to have some high expectations for you guys. I know some of you guys are listening to this, Team 18. <laughs> we're going to have some high expectations. You better get your mess in order. We did the pre-call the other night. There were only six of y'all on the pre-call. <laughs> you better get your mess in order, son. March is rough where we're going. It's a basic course plus. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. oh, yeah. But that's pretty much what we do around here. If you don't know what 307 Project is, we're a podcast and we're a training company. And we've got this thing called Nuff Said Running. <laughs> and we're coaches. Yeah. And toodlers. Um, well, uh, Professional business people. You know, let's talk oh, about yeah. something that Blake's passionate about. Um, Blake was just telling me about this constitutional carry thing. Why don't you tell us about that, Blake? Get us up to speed on that, because well, I, mean, I, I know don't... you're always thinking about that. You're a law follow. You're a rule follower. I don't know a lot about it. I just saw it on Instagram and looked it up. And apparently, these states, uh, I think there was 22 or 23 that have passed the bill to where now, before you would have to go get a weapons carry license to carry your gun in public legally, and so now they're just they've passed a law to where you can. They, I guess, are recognizing that that was unconstitutional. Now you can carry your gun wherever you want to carry it, however you want to carry it, like the Constitution says, and they've passed the law saying that uh, now now you can follow the Constitution and be <laughs> and and, uh, and do it legally. You don't have to do this other thing here. So. It, isn't it funny to pass a law that would restrict and charge a fee Mm-hmm. To people who choose to follow the law, the, the criminals are carrying their freaking guns. Do you think they care about your stupid law? Yeah. I mean, how stupid is that? I've been constitutional carrying for the last decade of my life. Mm-hmm. Screw your permits and your fees, man. I'm sick of this stuff. Well, man. you know, that's why I'm not a big fan of bills of rights, actually. Or. Because you better be a fan of it. Look uh, no. at look at Canada. They have one too. They have a Bill of Rights, and you know why I'm not a big fan they of it. They must have swept it under the rug. Here's why: is because it almost. Chris is getting pissed. Is because it almost <laughs> looks at it like, well, Harry, we're going to outline for you the rights that you have, and, and they're and they're spelled out here. No, I've got all the rights that that I've got all the God given natural rights that there are. You tell me what I can't do. I can't murder. I can't steal. I can't do that. Okay, you know, I can't infringe on somebody else's rights. Don't lay out for me the rights that I have. I've got them all. Like, that should just be the default, Mm -hmm. that I have every single one of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I don't even like laying them out. It's like, no, I don't need you to tell me that I have the right to to carry and to the right to free speech. No, I know I have that. God gave me that. You don't need to. You didn't give me that. That's what that's I don't like the mindset that bills of rights put people in is like, okay, the go- we got a good government. They give me the right to free speech and freedom of the press and right to bear arms. No, they didn't give me nothing. Well, that's 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 my I only point. I think you can say they they actually stand up 
to preserving those rights See, for it. you because somebody else that what the heck is wrong with humans? Why in the world do humans want to control other humans? I must have not been born with that gene. I don't want to control anybody. What is wrong with people, man? Do what you want to do, man. As long as it ain't as long as it ain't messing with me. Like no, that's and it's, the wrong attitude. And it's not. That's the wrong. Do what you want to do, long as it ain't messing and, with me. And it's well, well no, I agree no, that, with that. That's, that's how. That's the, not. The, I'm not talking about the church. I'm not talking about the body of Christ. I'm talking about society as a, a, so the secular society that we live in. Um, look, man, I agree with you. Look now, what you're doing can't be tearing down like the construct of society or other people. Like we all have to be, we all should be productive members, right? Yeah, I know it's it's a conversation. I I'm just so do sick. Do what makes you happy. Do what makes you happy. I'm just so sick of people trying to control other people, man. Oh no, yeah, that's not moral advice, Blake. It's just you. I mean, the government can't step in and make you do something. You just hey. As far as the government's concerned, that, that that's and that's what Chad's saying. Yeah, the only I mean the only people that you that that the only people that we have any right to hold accountable in terms of moral of personal moral moral choices is ourselves is ourselves and also people that are within the body of Christ, right? We have and are told to hold one another accountable. But not the uh but not this oh man He's constitutional carry man there's been a form of government in place all throughout history in every civilization and everything and everybody gets just as aggravated there's people that get it just as aggravated as you do throughout all of history well where do you think the first government was in in the garden of eden well, hey, what, what you was better the- hope i don't ever <laughs> meet anybody that works with the irs what was the structure i, I don't know any of them Blake don't know what he's talking about. You don't think the IRS exists, do you? I've not known anybody that works there. <laughs> I've not known anybody that knows anybody. Well, you know if it's real, you're at least two degrees of separation away. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Well, that's what Blake's passionate about. He likes to study the rules, what what the latest rules are. So, <laughs> <laughs> Yep, I've been studying it hard. He wanted to... <laughs> He wanted to put out there that y'all can carry your guns now. <laughs> Chad said that Alabama, Louisiana, and Mississippi don't do nothing and the states aren't known for anything. So I said, well, they just passed this law and that Georgia hasn't passed it yet. And so if y'all are ever wondering what the current rules are, just hit old Blake up. <laughs> wow. Well, that's real funny, isn't it? <laughs> oh, man. All right. All right, let's talk about something Krista's passionate about. Send it, Krista. What's that? I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> yeah, you, you're you telling everybody me. what we're passionate about. So, the all-knowing Chad, why don't you share with her what she's passionate about? <laughs> yeah, tell her. <laughs> what that? No, don't what? don't start short circuiting and and backpedaling. <laughs> share it. I'm, I'm, I'm. Let's uh, hear. Her. Uh. The, well, uh, well, um, Chris is passionate about doing this TV show. You, you, Here you go, talking about stuff you, you don't you, even know what you're you, talking about. You, you can't keep your mouth shut, can you? It's almost unbelievable. Look, man. Let's talk about something Chad's passionate about. Look, sharing things I mean, and talking no, about things that he some, knows nothing about. No, let me tell you what, what the mistake with, was with these people who he's talking to. They didn't make him sign a non-disclosure agreement. That's what they should have done. They didn't know who they were dealing with Well, here. they better get three of them signed with Chad. He'll be he'll be releasing the footage before. Look, man. I ain't worried about these TV heads. Look, man. You might run you up. You opp- seem like you are as much as you're talking about it. Good gosh. Look, um... This ain't the first time I, I've had the opportunity to do TV. Won't it, be the last. It's not. It, it, it ain't a. It ain't a secret here. Uh, but it also probably. Well, who knows? May not even happen. Well, yeah. I mean, is anything that I say nothing I say is really set? Really anything that 
is set in stone. I want something set in stone. I don't even like to talk about it anymore. Well, you act like it all is. I just happening. I just wish someone would do a reality show on him. That'd be what do y'all? What do y'all want to see? If we decide to do TV, what do y'all want to see? I'm asking the listeners. What were you going to say, Krista? About time you chimed in here. I wasn't going to say anything, but get on him. I was just thinking. Blake and I were starting to have a good conversation on our run today. Yeah. I mean, we could we could talk about that. What we yeah, we, we were started ha- until you all slowed down and came back with us and stopped yeah, I don't our know conversation. What slowed y'all down. Well, go ahead. Let's let's hear what y'all were talking about. I was trying to remember. We were talking about a book you were reading. Yeah. And I was tying it into a book that I was reading um, about, uh, you want to start with what you, the book you were reading, maybe, and yeah. the premise of it? Yeah, I've got it right here. It's, uh, gosh, man, you don't even remember what the book you're reading is called? <laughs> it has a really complicated you keep, title. You better just shut up or I'm going to turn my mic off and go in the other room. And you can talk about some of this other worthless well, salad you've got to serve the <laughs> listeners today. You would have put out on PT this morning. Maybe I'd give you a little respect. Well, if you would have told me where you was going, maybe I'd have stayed with you. Keep going. I want to hear. Rub his face in the dirt, Chad. Wouldn't be the wouldn't be the first time. You got cut last time you did that, and that ended that. <laughs> he cut me with a rock. Cut him deep. Anyways, <clears throat> my brother Hal did talk resurrected the other night and did a really good job and recommended this book called radical by david platt and i'm I'm not a big reader but i'm reading this one i'm four chapters in it right now but basically the premise of it is that he's talking about the american dream and how everything that's sold is uh, self-esteem self-confidence self-improvement and how really your greatest asset is your ability and how that's not really biblical and and he goes through and talks about how we're all just sinners we're born evil you know we have these bad morals but really we think we're good because of what the american dream is is selling and so it talks about the tagline of the book is taking your faith back from the american dream but uh it's just i mean to me it's been really good i it's It's just rehashed like the dedication that you should have to Jesus and and just makes you think about everything you do in a new light. And I don't even remember what what exactly parts of it we were talking about on the run today, but that's the premise of the book so far. I think we're talking about just that idea of thinking that you, it's all about the self and the self can, what you accomplish, you know, what, what... the values that you have, mm-hmm. that it's all kind of oriented around that and self-accomplishment and that you have this good to offer and forgetting that uh, that other side of yourself, that you're bent toward this, not, you know, you're not. And anything that you do really is the grace of God. And so we talked about, we were talking about how um, just the good that, that, that you can fall off the horse on the other side, though, mm-hmm. and then you can have an attitude of, man is worthless. We, we don't have anything in us that's good to offer and, but how we actually are made in the image of God. And so there is a foundation, um, as human beings, there is something essential to us that is good because we're made in the image of God. And so how you can fall off the horse on both sides with that perspective. And really it's about that balance in the middle. And, and then I think I I was tying it to a book that I'm reading, um, which I don't like to recommend books until I've finished them, but I think I would recommend this one, at least to get thought thought going, called uh, Bored, Lonely, Angry, Stupid. And it's written by a couple of people. One's a sort of um, historian. One is in more of a techno- technology field, two professors, bringing those two things together and showing how technology, uh, the history of technology, like when it enters in and how people change, but they're specifically addressing and looking at how technology changes the human being, like your emotions, like how we think about emotions, um, like how it's not just technology changing the shape of society and culture and how we're relating, but actually the individual, how it changes people. But one of the things that I tied to what Blake was saying is one of the things that is tracked is how Life and humans and society has shifted over time from a moral framework or way of looking at the world 
to a psychological framework. So where we look for answers of value and what actually is moral, true, good is now coming from a psychological framework like psychology at the turn of the century and all that shift that happened and not necessarily from just a moral or religious framework. So for instance, we virtues like solitude, which would have been a, a good virtue, is now flip-flopped and seen as a negative thing mm-hmm. or looking at vanity and pride and those kinds of things and how mm-hmm. the interplay of technology with all of that. But, but the idea that tying into what you were saying, the idea of the self, the self now because of sure. that shift to the psychological framework, a lot of what's embedded in that is a shift to the focus on the self mm-hmm. and self-help, self-esteem, self-improvement, um, that kind of thing. And so mm. it, I think, really fits with what you're yeah. saying, how all of that, you know, it, it, there are these undercurrents that a lot of times we're just not aware of. All that subtext. I right? was just going to say all there's that a subtext. subtext. <laughs> that that we, we are affected by and we don't see and we're not aware of. It's the water we're swimming in. And, but that just that simple shift to the focus on the self, you know, really does change the way that we enter the world, what we think yeah. about what's valuable in life, how we accomplish it, uh, whether we see it as the grace of God or through the power of God or through ourselves, uh, what we turn to. So when something happens now, what, what do we turn to? We turn to counselors, therapists, mm-hmm. psychologists, which I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. Um, that, that can be helpful and needed. I'm not saying that, but I, it convicted me cause I was like, what do I turn to first back in the past before that was a framework for us as a society? We probably most people would pray to God, you mm-hmm. know, there's trouble, there's struggle, there's adversity, there's strife. They would pray to God first, you yeah. know, that's where you went. And now that's usually the last place we go. We go to those self-help books. We go to even friends, but the friends advice probably are based on self-help books and Mm -hmm. therapy and things like that. So, so we, we started to have a pretty fascinating conversation about that shift toward toward the self. Um, And so I think our two books sort of connected in that. Yeah. And I think, I mean, this book even kind of revealed a little bit, I think in me, maybe a little bit of pride that I had of just how I, not that I think I'm the best or anything special, but I, I, I mean, hope you don't think that. I could think like, well, I, I'm doing all right. I'm doing pretty good. I'm going to start interjecting in your talks, and we'll uh, hear pretty soon on today's podcast. I'm going to do it. But um, just the way he talks about things, and I don't know where I was going well, with it now that Chad interrupted well, me. Well, I, I got a question. You talk about pride. I think a lot of us have pride that we're not even aware of. Well, that's what but, I, that's what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. I think this book kind of pointed that out, some of it in my life. And, you know, Krista mentioned the self a lot. Have you ever tried to define that? What is the self? For me, I, I've thought about it a lot. And I, I, I'm like, well, wouldn't it help understand things if I could even wrap my head around a definition of that? But I almost can't. Because every time someone asks, well, who are you? At least me, I start going, well, I'm, I run and, <laughs> you know, you just talk about mm-hmm. stuff you do. Yeah. Well, that's not who you are. No. So what, who are you? And then you can go, okay, well, I'm, I'm, I'm a son and, you know, if you're a brother or if you're, you're a father or mother and then, okay, well, that's who you are in relation to other people. Well, who are you? I, I, that's an interesting question. Yeah. I don't know, I, and I think, I think that kind of. I think she's exactly right, pointing out that our perception of ourselves has changed over time, and I think technology's played a lot into that. But what exactly is changing, and what did it change from to? And I think it's made us more prideful. I mean, I think generally that's true, mm-hmm. but I don't know. I don't even know what it what is the self, and it kind of goes back to what she mentioned earlier with people being kind of this good and bad paradigm and, and, um, you know, we're our sinful yet. We're also made in the image of God. Mm-hmm. Well, what does the image of God mean? Because to me, I think it's always important to look at the original text, the original language that the Bible was written in and the image of God. So to me, I mean, does that just relate to our, I've, I've heard some people even 
try to relate that to our physical appearance, but to me, it's probably, or I could see it at least being as simple as the image of God. There's this, we talked about it last time, physical realm, spiritual realm. God is this incomprehensible, quote unquote, spiritual being. And, and that's the part of us that we can't see in this physical realm. Is that what that means? Maybe the, the, that's the image. That's how we're made in the image of him. So the self is actually whatever that is. Yeah. That, that, that kind of lives out in this physical realm, but we have a hard time even grasping that Mm -hmm. because we're here in the physical. You see what I'm saying? I just, I know that's random, but no. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's some deep thinking. (laughs) Well, I don't know about that. I just, I was trying to understand what what yeah, both yeah. of y'all were saying, and I'm like, yeah. well, how do I, you know, make sense of it? Yeah, I think well, I mean, and, and even using the language self, that the point of reference of that it likely is a psychological term, right? Like, like it's right, the, it's the ego. Yep, you know, yeah, but, ego. But so, are we even trapped by just using that language? I feel like we are, and I think that's kind of what you're saying. Yeah, it sounds yeah. like what you're saying. Yeah. Well, he says in this book that. The modern day gospel says God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Therefore, follow these steps and you can be saved. Meanwhile, the biblical gospel says you are an enemy of God, dead in your sin and in your present state of rebellion. You're not even able to see that you need life, much less cause your life, cause yourself to come to life. Therefore, you're radically dependent on God. And so all throughout the Bible, he's talking about, I mean, throughout this book, he's talking about how much are you dependent on God and and do you think that some areas of your life you have under control and others you don't and he talks about going to this like underground church in Asia or something and he's sitting with these people and they have to like sneak him into this building in order because they're they're going to meet and talk about the gospel and he mm-hmm. says there's one light bulb hanging from the middle of the ceiling and there's like 11 people in the room in a circle and they're all talking and so he's teaching them he's over there must be over there to teach those christian leaders that they can bring back to their congregation. And he's like, they, they came up to me and they said, wow, we've never, we've never heard any of this. Um, can you teach us the old Testament? And he's like, like laughs, like that's a lot to cover. And they're like, no, seriously, we have farms, we have things going on, but we'll leave all that for two weeks. If you can teach us the old Testament in two weeks. And so they (laughs) do. And then, he finishes that and they say, well, you haven't taught us the New Testament. And he's like laughs. And so he said he covers like the New Testament as much as he can in his last day there. And he said when he got back to his church, he pastors a big church in Alabama. He said when he got back there, he thought, man, the difference here between where I was at and where I, I'm pastoring in Alabama is just night and day. And he said, I wonder if I removed all of these things that we have for comfort and all would people still come so he did it he he basically took down all the decorations now they still had their facility he said they had air conditioning and they had comfortable chairs but no music no performance no uh you know nothing attractive basically and so they were to show up at six o'clock at night and they were to stay till midnight and so it's a six-hour thing. Dude, and that sounds like my kind of church meeting right there, son. He said they all were to bring their Bible, and everyone was going to sit and read and pray, and they were going to worship God, but there was no kind of, you know, nothing fancy. And so he put it out, and he said thousands of people showed up. And he was like, dang. And so they did it again, and he said so many more people wanted to come the second time that they had to take reservations because their building wouldn't hold it. And all, that's all they're doing is reading their Bible. And I thought, man, that's a pretty cool experiment he did and, and interesting that mm-hmm. people responded the way that what, the way that they did. Well, you know, uh, uh, I guess I'm never going to get to talk on this podcast. Go ahead, Chili. The, the listeners are so <laughs> They're like, it's about time. This is going to be the number one <laughs> downloaded podcast on all of all time. Go ahead, Chili. Well, no, go ahead. You, can, know, you no. can title I, it. I didn't know you were going to. No, I ain't got nothing. You can uh, title it crap. The, the podcast where Chad doesn't talk. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just. that down. <laughs> I was just going to just comment on what you said about that style of church service. You know what it shows people are hungry for? Mm-hmm. Actual. Several things, but mm-hmm. actual studying of the word actual study actual Mm -hmm. knowledge gaining actual community because i'm sure it was a real you know 
intimate yeah. e- experience where you actually prayed together and you and you asked questions maybe and you learned and like I think a lot of these modern day church meetings are pray with all the the fancy music which you know I'm not saying that that's good or bad I, I don't but that's the way they are and people just kind of come in there most people it's really just kind of going through the motions yeah. and I don't like the loud music it gives me a headache and it I mean that would be that's my experience going through the motions now some people would say well that ain't how I it's not that for me I would hope it's not it's not supposed to be yeah but I think I've heard a lot of people share that sentiment unfortunately and and then it's a message that that you just sit down and listen to. You don't have any interaction. You don't discuss. You don't ask questions. You don't, you know, there's no, it's just like you're getting talked at and then you may leave with a bunch of questions. It's maybe a good sermon, but you go, how, how do I, you know, and then you, you just don't go look into it anymore, investigate it anymore, yeah. try to apply it, anything. It's just, I don't know. I, I think, I think it's really missing what people actually want. Uh, well, when I read that, I thought, man, I'm, like I want to put one of these on. Mm-hmm. It like we can do that. It, it would be cool. It'd be an actual. I study. would want to go to it. Yeah, and you could talk about look yeah, at Barron Stadium down. You don't there. even Let's have do to this. talk. You just say, "Hey, show up with your Bible. We're going to all meet here." I'm gonna tell you know maybe yeah That's you get I'm up saying. there and say there doesn't even have to be one person delivering an hour long message. Yep, exactly. Yep. Well, one of the things Blake and I when we were discussing this that I said was it would be easy to look at it as a rebuke for the way that we do church right now, like the normal way we gather, sing songs, we have somebody speak um, about scripture. It would be easy to look at it as like, oh, well, like a binary thing. Well, this this is better. This worked and that's, you know, so this is better than that. And um, these people responded in this way. But one of the things I think that to consider is it's possible that what this pastor did is he just provided space for people to engage scripture on a personal level, to sit in solitude and quiet, which we don't get to do anymore. Or if we get to, we don't choose to. Mm -hmm. And just be quiet. I was thinking about when we were running today, the connection I was going to ask about running and running these long distances. Like, man, I wonder if one of the biggest obstacles for people in running like a longer distance or an ultra is just the unsettled nature of being alone. And having that solitude, like mm-hmm. it's uncomfortable. Like that would be like not even just the physical part of the running would be hard, but just the ability with all the stimulation we have and all the mm. the social interaction we have and constantly needing feedback, like that aspect, that would be an interesting topic to discuss at some point with running. But on on a different level with this experience with the church and reading scripture, it's possible that what this pastor did that it's not one thing against the other, but maybe he tapped into something that's a great need for people, like just to create space to sit with God quietly, privately, with no distraction, and meditate on Scripture and be in the Word. Mm-hmm. And so so I think it's a both and can, can be a thing. I yeah. think, you know, there are fair criticisms of the way that we do church and, you know, all that for sure, absolutely. But I don't think it, they'd have to be opposed. They're not mutually exclusive. And so just having that space and creating that space for your congregation for, for, or for people is significant in itself. Yeah, you certainly don't have to get rid of the other. No, they would yeah. just be complimentary of each Absolutely. other. Absolutely, yeah. And he yeah. calls this secret yeah. church. They mm-hmm. do it on a Friday night. Yeah, yeah. You know, and yeah. I bet if you if you kept providing things like this too, people would come and you never know what would come out of it. Some people would come and maybe have this idea of what they wanted to get out of it and do. And then 30 minutes in, they just start, they, you know, it's a, turns into a therapy session, you well, know, in the I mean, presence of God. Like, yeah, you're right. You don't know what's going to yeah, happen. Yeah. I mean, it just, well, it's an interesting to think, to think, to think too. people who kind of, um, lead or organize gatherings of believers Okay, one one tactic is to, is to say how's culture going, and we need to kind of sh- sh- you know transform to the culture and kind of fit in with mm-hmm. how culture is going, which in some ways might sort of work in quotes. But what a what a I think a pastor's heart does is says what do my people need 
And precisely what they might need is what the culture is not offering, which is connection with God, solitude, quietness. You know, that might actually be the deeper need that people have. Oh, yeah. And so then to tap into that and say, okay, this is sort of countercultural because right now my people are overly stimulated. My people are whatever. So maybe what a, a what a pastor can offer that might be very um, redemptive and healing to people is actually quiet and space and things that are against the way they're operating right now. To me, there's power in, power in radical counterculture. Mm-hmm. That's when a lot of times you expose what's really needed. Well, I that's mean, what he, that's what David Platt was saying, is saying in that book. He said, you know, he took on this pastoring this church at a really young <laughs> age and he was deemed the youngest mega church pastor. And he said, I thought when I got here, like this church has such good tithers and such good music and such good, all of this, so much money. It can do so amazing things. And he said that was wrong because he said, it's actually the churches that don't have all that, that can, that is capable of doing more than these churches that have all of this, because when they do something good, God gets the glory for it. When we do something good, it's like, well, yeah, of course you should do something good. You have a mega church and all these resources and God doesn't necessarily get the glory for the things that happens. And, uh, he says that's what keeps him up at night is he is fearful that a lot of his congregation thinks that they're saved and going to heaven and they're actually not because they don't they because of how it has been sold to them as say this prayer do these things and and cheap grace you, yeah he explained the way he explains it is that uh, you you do these things and yeah I'm a pretty good person and he said you add to that some superstitious prayer and some church attendance and it's like man I'm going to be good in the end and so now I can go on living and that's exactly you know uh, the message Chad gave the the men's group that he spoke at in Fort Payne it, it lines up a lot with this book and uh, I I mean I just really like it so far it's it's been pretty revealing and and has kind of stirred the fire of rad you know because yeah I mean I I will drift away from that because you're in, in America. I think you're at a disadvantage because that's what's sold and that's what's pushed and that's what's around. So you got to always be on guard against those things. But I think it's that, that phrase always be on guard is key because I think it is a heart issue. It's easy to look at um, something that's really stripped down, like, like this very simple service or people in other countries that all they can do is like be at home with their Bible. Like that's Mm -hmm. it. (laughs) Like it's totally scaled back. And then compare that to like at the top end of the scale, like a mega church where you have like all these resources and capabilities to gather and sing and do all of this without fear of uh, getting arrested. And so yeah. you have this whole spectrum of experience and it's easy to look along that spectrum spectrum and judge one another and say your, you know, your belief, your expression, your, your form of Christianity is worse or better than mine. And we were talking, I said, Blake and I were running and I said, this isn't the greatest illustration, but what just came to mind is just CrossFit and how, you know, you scale to the individual. And so some people are just at that bottom level, basic, like just trying to get range of motion, you know, and then you have people. Don't look at me. (laughs) You're beyond that, Chili. And then you build some skills on that and then you build, you know, and then you're, you're building and you can add things to it because that's just where you are. That's the reality of where you are. Um, and then you have people at the top end who maybe are like, um, c- compete uh, worldwide in the open and, you know, that are professional CrossFit athletes. And so would it be fair or right to say you at the top, this, you know, you have all these resources, you have all these abilities. Um, you need to be like those other people. No, you want them to what, do the best with what they have, be good stewards of what they have. And so if that's just where they are, you know, they have the ability to gather, do these things, then that might just be the right expression at that moment for them. And the danger is being up there and letting those things uh, like pride and, you know, apathy and all of those things be the corrupting features of that expression Uh, Mm. just like somebody could have pride because they're living a simple Christian life because Mm -hmm. they don't do all of those things and that could be just as prideful (laughs) so I think think you're better yeah so wherever you are on that spectrum just be where you are and you know if you have the ability to gather with other believers 
you know, great. If you don't, you know, that's just where you are. It's so personal. And what you need to be on guard of is that the heart issues Mm -hmm. behind it. And the one thing that's pretty clear about what would be off is if you're judging other people, like that's pretty explicit in the Bible, (laughs) you know? So, so that's where you need to be guarding your heart is that judgment, that pride, you know, which can easily kind of go by the wayside and we cannot be aware of. So Chad, you've been pretty quiet. Yeah, you don't you ever talk on say? these podcasts. We're going to flip got, this on you now. What you got, Chad? You know yeah. what? What you got? The, you know what? You got, I am so proud of my team. <laughs> I am so proud of my team members. Because what y'all don't understand about me is the the um, ultimate success for me is to just work myself completely out of a job. And you guys just put on a master class of a podcast without me. And that was just the highest compliment you could have ever paid me. So I want to thank you guys. It's the highest compliment I've received from you guys. Thanks, Bubba. I am so proud of my team, including you, Blake. I'm not even mad at you anymore. (laughs) It's all because because of your tutelage. Yep. Man, (laughs) that's the first thing I had. I've just been over here taking notes, you know. Uh, going back to what Krista said about the solitude aspect, y'all want to know what the one of the hardest things that I try to do every year is I go out into the woods and I pick a really remote place on the side of a creek and I set my tent up and I spend 24 hours in that spot and I can't bring anything to distract me from the solitude. It's just me, the creek, and the tent. And I can't leave that spot. And I just sit there for 24 hours. And I can sleep if I want to. But um, that is one of the hardest things that I do every year. And that's just 24 hours. Mm -hmm. So you talk about how uncomfortable people are with solitude. It's challenging. Because of the environment that we live in. Another thing that Krista talked about. Krista, you just really laid out some really profound, articulated uh, information, I think. Really, you did. And another thing she talked about is where do we turn to in this um, technology world, right? And, and, And how we turn to mental health professionals and and again I agree with Krista I go to to a I, I have a personal counselor Jeremy and um, I go we me and Brooke go see him once a week it's a beautiful thing it's wonderful he's become our great friend I mean he's a friend right but we turn to these professionals um when you ask the question, where do we turn when we get confused or things start happening? And Krista said, well, most of the time back in the old days, people would have probably first fell on their face and prayed to Jesus. And and I think another thing, though, that we're missing so much is real community. Mm-hmm. Because here's the thing. We can act like we live in community together here in Rome, Georgia. We don't really depend on each other, right? I'm talking about in the past when people, families, lived on a single piece of land and you had three or four generations plus uncles, plus aunts, plus you had everybody that was there. And everybody had a specific role and responsibility, And you literally depended on one another, literally depended on one another to stay alive. We don't have that because we don't have to have it anymore. And think about if you were living in that intimate community with generations of family members or very, very close friends even, Think about how much more you would be apt to really turn to those people also. And they would be available. They would be available. They're there. And and if I'm not doing good and I'm part of that community, 
Well, it affects them, so it's in their best interest to come and counsel me and help build me back up. We don't have that anymore. And, and I even think about that in terms of marriage. You know, we see marriage is a uh, overwhelmingly seems like a failing institution these days. Um, even even within the church, I mean, it's just like people just are so f- flippant about divorce and and this and that and and even a husband and wife. You know, for the majority of the time, they're not really depending on each other. The wife has a job. Or she can get a job. She has an education. The husband has a job. Or he can get a job. They, they, they go to the grocery store. How much different would marriage be if the wife looked at the husband climbing up the hill to the front door with a deer on his back, literally providing for the life of the family, and then the husband sees the wife doing whatever her role and responsibility is within that union, literally providing for the life of the husband. Like how much different would marriage be then? How would you look at your how would you look at your wife differently if you li- literally knew that you weren't going to make it without what she was providing? And likewise, how much differently would you look at your husband? If you literally knew you couldn't make it without what he was providing. I I miss that so much. Well, I've never experienced that, but I I I, I crave the, the concept of it. Well, and I think that concept is important because we don't live in that time where most people are going out and hunting and bring that's their their sustenance and we just don't live in that context. But that uh, concept of thinking, seeing that other person as necessary and needed and that they are, even though it's a little more abstract, they're farther removed from the picture of provision that maybe a deer over the shoulders provides. My husband goes and earns a living and works and he does provide. So I need to be thankful for what he offers, knowing that he is providing for our family. He's going out and working. And he's not doing it in the same way, but he's making many sacrifices Mm -hmm. to do that for the family. And likewise, I'm doing my own things to provide for the family and make sacrifices for our family. And and so it just take might take a lot more work, but I would encourage our listeners to if they're married and and maybe they've become numb to that Mm -hmm. and just aren't aware, like think hard about that. Think hard about what is that other person providing and what would life be like without them and what they do. And if you recognize something, speak it. Say it to your spouse. Say it to your loved ones that you see them and you see that they provide a great need, even though it's, it may not be very obvious or clear. Mm-hmm. That can And just speaking that too, can that can be a great thing to just – encourage and bolster that other person and create unity and that vision of teamwork. Mm -hmm. I think we can, I think you're right, Krista. I think we can move in that direction, even within the construct of the way life is for us. Now Mm -hmm. we can move in that direction, but, but you can't fake the real thing. Mm -hmm. You you just, you, you just can't fake the real thing because, because the way things are, there's always an out. Because you are not, like, literally, to the very core, depending on this person. And so, you know, I agree with you. I'm yeah, just, yeah, I'm yeah. just, I'm just, I don't know that you not- would ever be to a point where you could not live without another human being. By If you were killing the deer, you could cook the deer. No, I... Humans, I humans are made to live in community because it yeah. takes the community for the human race to survive. But if you're just talking about surviving, like my life could not exist how it is now without my wife. Well, it, I, I mean, couldn't see my kids every I night. See, I couldn't. I see what J- uh, Chad's saying, though, because it is like we live in this world now, this modern world where it's boundaryless. And I can remember growing up as a kid, Brian and I joke about this all the time, where you had boundaries around you that you don't have anymore, like 
all this stuff that's on demand. You can have what you want when you want mm-hmm. it. Like we grew up when you had to get up from the couch to turn the television knob and you had like three channels and there were boundaries, natural boundaries that you had to live within. And you had Saturday morning cartoons that were on for maybe an hour or two Saturday mornings. And if you missed it, you missed it. (laughs) And so there were natural boundaries in life. And now we have to work hard to create boundaries that we never had to create before. And so I think it's similar in that because of the way life has changed, these things, you're right, we don't have to, there, there were boundaries. There used to be natural boundaries to sustaining life and living within it. And we don't have those boundaries mm-hmm. anymore, which complicates things mm-hmm. and, and does change kind of like the book I'm reading, like all of those little shifts change who we are as humans, how mm-hmm. we rate in the relate in the world and what we experience. And so I, I totally understand what you're saying. And a lot of people are even opposed to the type of life I'm talking about. Like a lot of people listening to this, including pe- people in my family are sitting here thinking, there's no way I would live n- next to my mother-in-law. There's no way I would live next to my aunt or uncle. And it's like, well, yeah, because it's th- now that this is this is this is America, right? Like my picture of this, uh, I'm like Chili. All the gold is mine. When I get enough money, I'm buying a big piece of land. And all my people are all my people that will come are gonna be there. And and we're gonna we're gonna live in community and we're gonna depend on one another, right? And then all of a sudden you're like, Boy, I don't like old <laughs> old Aunt Susie over there, but she sure does do a good job pulling them weeds out of that garden. And I like the food that comes out of that garden, so I can get over the things I don't like about her personality. I don't know. I just have a picture of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So um all the gold is mine. Uh, that's a great conversation. I want to finish on something here that I think ties in with the conversation that you guys have been having and I've been sitting here listening to. Thank goodness. Um, you know, I, I have, I have many, I, I have maybe five or 10 parts of scripture that I go back to over the decades. I go back to them decades, over the decade, all right, that I've been a Christian. I'm getting a little ahead of myself here. One is Matthew chapter 5, the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, okay? And specifically, uh, verses 3 through 12. And I, I go back to these year after year after year. And I went back to them yesterday, and yesterday was a really, really difficult day for me because of things that were going on. And I read in verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And I don't think that I had ever understood what it meant to be poor in spirit until yesterday. And when I read that, I said, it, it like popped off the page at me. Like, oh, I understand what this is saying. Poor in spirit. Because that, that don't sound good. Jesus is saying, blessed is the poor in spirit. He's not, he's not saying blessed are, in, in another place he says, blessed are the poor. But here he's saying, blessed are the poor in spirit. And yesterday I reached a point where I was just, I was at the end of my strength. I was just undone. I was completely undone. And I, I didn't even want to talk. I didn't even want to talk. I was just, and then I, I came to Christ in prayer in my at the end of my rope, just in my undoneness, uh, like unraveled, right? And I realized I'm poor in spirit, right? Like I am poor in spirit. And the fact that I, I am poor in spirit, that I am undone, and I'm coming to him, 
genuinely seeking him. It's it's a whole nother it's a whole nother experience, man. But to me, that's what that means. The poor in spirit. When you're at the end of your rope, when you say there's nothing else that I can do in this situation, I'm I have no strength left. I don't feel strong anymore. I I don't feel like I can carry another ounce of burden. And the burden that's on me is crushing me. And you become poor in spirit. And you cry out to Christ. No wonder he says it's blessed to be poor in spirit. Because your relationship with him becomes different when you are truly poor in spirit. Yeah, you can see who he is. When you're not poor in spirit, you're not going to see who he is. Yep. Would anybody disagree with that or have a different perspective on that? No, it's the Bible. You can't disagree with I'm that. Saying, I'm saying the meaning or the yeah. feeling of, because that's hard to understand. Mm-hmm. Really, I mean. So what do you think poor in spirit means? I think. Well, I just spent five minutes explaining it. Well, no, I mean, you think it means, I'm trying to get you to clarify when you ask. Being poor in, what it felt like for me yesterday when I read this meant. Just at the end of your rope. That I was literally being crushed by the burden that was on me. I couldn't, I, I couldn't carry another ounce of it. And I was completely undone. I didn't want to do it anymore. I didn't want to. Usually I feel strong. Yeah. Right? Usually I feel like, yeah, man, whatever's happening, bring it, man. I can take it. Usually that's how I feel. And you you approach Christ differently when that is your posture than when you are poor in spirit. And I don't know, I don't know that, being poor in spirit is a choice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's the, the um, being impoverished, being empty, <clears throat> having no no money in the bank account, you know, and, and that drives you in a very different way. It, it made me think about your picture, actually, while you're talking about the, it's the need. It drove you to re- recognize your need for God and how your dependence on Him. And it made me think of, actually, the picture of you describing the the man the husband bringing the the deer on his shoulders and without this provision you wouldn't survive you've yeah. got nothing and so that's a picture of that that need that you have otherwise you'd starve um but then also the provision and so it helps i think people to recognize not only the need of the father but also the provision that <laughs> Whatever they ha- need right now and whatever they've actually had, it reminds them, oh, all that stuff that I've had when I've been full, my belly's been full, you know, when when I haven't been starving, it's because you've been providing that to me. Mm-hmm. So even, even in that moment, it's not just about the forward thinking and the forward need, but also looking back and saying, oh, I was blind to all that, mm-hmm. that everything good that sustained me actually came from your hand. <laughs> And yep. so I think there, there are two sides to that coin. I think that's the definition of, like, humility or humble or mm-hmm. whatever. When you get to that point and you realize really how much you are dependent it, it, on God. I can see where you can make that connection, but it did not feel that way for me. Mm-hmm. I didn't feel humble. I didn't feel humbled. Mm-hmm. I just felt like I'm not strong anymore. Mm-hmm. Like, And I hated it. I remember a time in my life where I I was familiar with praying, Lord, be my strength, be my, be, or, sorry, Lord, give me strength, give me strength, give me strength. And I would often pray, give me strength for things going on in my life. And um, But I vividly remember a period in my life where without really consciously doing it, <clears throat> excuse me, my <clears throat> prayer shifted to, Lord, be my strength, which is different. And so that kind of feeling poor in spirit, like I've got nothing like I, I, and I've, I've been saying, give me strength, but I'm at a point where I can't, I can't even pray that. Like I need you to be my strength. Mm -hmm. So it's not even, I'm completely empty and I just need you to be my strength. Mm -hmm. Like I just, I need you. That's it. I just need you. 
And I don't know if that's a similar feeling that you had, but, Mm -hmm. but just that total emptiness and Mm -hmm. just hundred percent dependence on who God is, not even what he can give me, but just who he is. Mm -hmm. And that's different. Yeah. Yeah. And like I say, I don't think it's a choice. I think, Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe it is once you, uh, once you become more mature in Christ or whatever, but for me right now, it's not a choice. I mean, life has to drive me to that point where I'm feeling poor in spirit, Mm -hmm. but I didn't understand that until yesterday. And, um, so many of these beatitudes have to do with your your spiritual your posture toward God, right? And even toward the world. And they're so exact opposite from what we would call good or blessed. Mm-hmm. Exact opposite. The next one is blessed are they that mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are you that mourn. Mourn for what? Well, for me, the last week or so, it's been mourning for the brokenness of people. Like, so don't look at that as like, I have to have, somebody has to die that's close to me for me to be in that place of mourning. Blessed are they that mourn. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. How about that one? He calls persecution a blessing. Whew. That's a little backwards, isn't it? Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Now, verse 12 was what picked me up and and allowed me to have enough strength to get through the day. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. For great is your reward in heaven. That got me, son. And I'll finish it out. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. In other words, you're not alone. This is the the process. But yeah, I just wanted to share that. And all or most of those things are about guaranteed if you are actually living for Jesus. You're going to experience those, some of, or maybe all of those things to some degree. Yeah. It's an interesting note here in, um, in, the, uh, in this Henry Morris Bible. In verse 9, verse 9, Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers. And Henry Morris said, Jesus did not say, blessed are the pacifists, but blessed are the peacemakers. There's a difference there. There's so much in these in these few verses that you can really contemplate, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. And that's why I think I keep coming back to them year after year. But that first one, verse 3, and the last one, verse 12, was really stood out to me yesterday. What do you think, Chili? I think about a lot. Nothing to add. I ain't got nothing to add to that. It would, nah. All right. Well, um, hey, I figured out something. I, I just figured out something a minute ago. Have you guys heard us talk about hoist on the podcast? If you're listening, just shake your head. If you have, shake <laughs> your head yes or no. Okay, if you shook your head no, hoist is uh, our hydration partner here at 307 Project because we actually we actually run and we actually work out. As a matter of fact, we did Team PT this morning. Blake didn't do all the miles. Me, Chili, and Krista ended up running nine miles. Chili only prescribed eight, but we ran nine. We went above and beyond. And then I won the plank contest. I don't... 
If y'all notice, we haven't talked about Team PT the last few weeks because uh-huh. Chad lost every single one of them, and now he's won something and has a <laughs> why did something you, to talk about. Why did you guys bow out of the plank contest so soon? Well, I figured if I'm not going to win it, which seemed apparent, why suffer for three more minutes? <laughs> well, I mean, I just collapsed. but I can plank for days, man. We got to set new parameters and do it again. Yeah, we need to have some clear standards. Because I tried to do an actual plank. I didn't do the the slouch method like you did. It was within the standards. I I, I know, but... Yeah. Sag. I tried to actually plank and... Yeah, Chili, yours looked pretty good. You were spot on. (laughs) As usual. Why'd you quit, Blake? Uh, My socks kept slipping and... (laughs) I just didn't have any desire to win against you. I looked over there at you. I knew you were hurting. I mean, my shoulders were a little bit sore, but yeah, you're weak, dude. Um, but yeah. we, yeah, uh, we usually, um, we we need something to hydrate because we actually train, man. This ain't the ginger runner, all right. Boy, he is. We actually run. He has slapped and, nailed uh, him twice, and, now. and so hoist. <laughs> Jeez. We love their brand. We love their brand, and we love their product, we, and we love what they stand for, um, which is supporting the military, which is good, from what I've seen and heard, values and good people, and fitness and health, and we love all that stuff. So we partner with Hoist. Hoist is more than just an effective beverage. Uh, it's battlefield proven, son. IV level hydration. And it absorbs instantly and replenishes the body immediately to keep you powering through to the next objective. Yeah, it does good and it tastes good. You want to know how I know it works good? Because I pee all the time. And when I, I can down some hoists, and honestly, I don't pee near as much. And it's just got to be because of my body's absorbing this, maybe because the salt that's in it and this stuff. This bottle of hoist has 430 milligrams of sodium. Is that a lot? Oh, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's good. It's good. So oh, that, yeah. That's helping you re- retain that water a little bit better. Ain't no other drink in that space has that much electrolytes in it. It's got more than just sodium, too. That's, yep. why, that's why I think it's... Calcium, potassium, magnesium... It's the complete spectrum of electrolytes. Most just have sodium, and it's only a small amount. That's why I piss so it, on them. It's working good. It's working really good, and we're enjoying it. If if um, But here's what I found out. Hoist and coffee are really good together. I am not kidding you. I know it sounds insane, but I've been taking a sip of my coffee and then taking a sip of hoist, and it's really good. So what are you saying? They need to come I'm out being with serious. a. What are you saying? They need to come out with a caffeinated version. No, yeah, I'm, that would be awesome. Watch this. This tastes really good. You kind of let the coffee taste get in your mouth. There's his coffee. There's his hoist. They go hand in hand. Have you, tried, have you tried to pour it in your coffee? I have not tried that yet. Go ahead, hit it one time. So that's the that's the watermelon. All right, hoist. Here too. we go. Watermelon hoist, and this is. This is now cold Americano. Cold brew. You don't know. It's not cold brew. All right. I, I don't I don't know. I'm not measuring here. I'm just going. All right. That's about. Let's let's see how this tastes. Let's spit it out. No, it's not bad. <laughs> it's really not bad. I'm telling you. <laughs> so they need a caffeinated version is what you're saying. No, just a coffee creamer. <laughs> oh, okay. Just clear coffee creamer. It really is good together. So it's hard to believe. I, it New really is. I, I could not believe it. When I, I when I did it the first time and I was like, dang, that's good. I could believe it. Allie, if you're listening to this, you need to pass that up the chain. <laughs> <laughs> so hey guys. God. Support the companies that support three to seven project in the podcast. Go get you some hoist. They've got a pro code. Yep. I'll attach their website and the pro code in the show notes of this episode. For y'all that don't know where the show notes are, they're under the episode. Look, all you got to do is click the link, and it'll take you. Good gosh, Dusty. It'll take you right to them. I thought you just puffed on a cigar or something. <laughs> what the heck was that? Uh, I'm all right, man. guys. Well, that was a great podcast. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Share the podcast with somebody. 
gosh, you turds. Share the podcast with somebody. Quit being a turd. <laughs> gotcha! <laughs> Enough said. <laughs>